Uh, welcome to this uh, session, uh, the lecture on wireless sensor uh, networks. Uh, today we will begin the first chapter, uh, which is applications uh, of uh, wireless sensor networks. Uh, in my previous sessions, I gave you an introductory uh, lecture on wireless sensor networks. <coughs> we discussed how I organized uh, the lecture. Uh, I also gave you a brief introduction about uh, wireless sensor networks, uh, what they are consisting of. Um, we briefly uh, discussed the anatomy of a wireless sensor node, uh, how these nodes come together to self-organize and set up uh, a wireless sensor uh, network. Today we will see in more detail uh, some of the applications of wireless sensor uh, networks. The first application we will uh, discuss is structural health uh, monitoring. In civil engineering and in mechanical engineering, uh, structural health monitoring is a well-established discipline. Uh, it is uh, uh, inspection, it deals with the inspection of the integrity of uh, complex um, structures such as uh, bridges, uh, complex buildings, uh, industrial complexes, airplanes, and ships. Uh, you may recall two years ago in Genoa, Italia, uh, Italy, a bridge uh, collapsed and uh, according to the EPC uh, news, uh, 300 feet from um, sea level, the uh, deck collapsed, uh, killing instantly uh, at least 35 uh, people. Uh, more than 30 cars were on the bridge uh, while the bridge collapsed. Of course, this problem is not uh, eccentric to uh, Italy. Uh, in 2007, in downtown uh, Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota, uh, another bridge uh, collapsed. Uh, and during this collapse, nine people instantly were dead and more than 20 um, cars were uh, on the bridge uh, while the bridge uh, collapsed. The collapse of this bridge is uh, um, interesting uh, because uh, following the uh, collapse of the bridge, there was a heated uh, disagreement between a construction company uh, uh, and uh, the municipality uh, of Minneapolis. Uh, the problem was the following. <laughs> At the time the bridge uh, collapsed, uh, there was a nearby uh, construction taking place uh, and this construction uh, has blocked uh, eight, uh, four of the eight uh, lanes leading to this uh, bridge. And the uh, municipality alleged that the construction company was responsible for the collapse because they uh, were using uh, shakers and, uh, to level the, the, the ground for the construction. And they alleged that the amount of vibration they uh, uh, produced was more than uh, the permissible amount. And as a result of this, the bridge collapsed. Of course, the construction company uh, uh, rejected this uh, accusation, claiming instead that wear and tear were responsible for the uh, collapse of the, the bridge. The municipality did not allegedly uh, inspect the integrity of the, uh, the bridge uh, on a regular basis. Uh, how do uh, civil engineers normally uh, inspect the health of uh, this type of complex uh, infrastructure? And how can they uh, avoid uh, or prevent this type of uh, collapse. Uh, there is a well-established 
uh, a well-established uh, guideline to inspect uh, complex uh, structures. In civil engineering, at least four types of inspections should take place uh, on a regular basis, but in different uh, interval and in different uh, complexity. The first type of inspection is uh, just visual inspection. Uh, the municipality or the um, company which is responsible for the inspection should send people on a regular basis, probably once a day, and see if the big components of the uh, structure are working properly and there is no visible um, damage to this structure. Of course, this type of inspection is labor intensive because you have to send people uh, uh, to the, the structure and people are quite subjective. Their um, perception or uh, assessment is often inconsistent uh, and it's also tedious. The second type of uh, inspection is called a basic inspection. This takes place at least uh, once a year. Here, you, you don't send uh, just uh, ordinary people, but experts, experts who are familiar with the uh, nitty gritty of the structure. So if, for example, we are inspecting a bridge, uh, civil engineers will be typically um, the, quali the qualified uh, personnel to inspect the integrity of the deck, the suspension cables, the towers, and uh, so on. Uh, this takes place at least once a year. Uh, typically, uh, during basic inspection also, uh, people uh, introduce uh, or induce uh, forced excitation to the structure. For example, using impact hammer, uh, vibrators, so that they can inspect the response of the bridge uh, to this type of excitation. Uh, besides, they also see how the structure uh, reacts to ambient excitation, for example, to wind or uh, to cars uh, driving on the structure. So if the, the, the oscillation of the, the structure, for example, the bridge or the, the building is um, a little old or not as it uh, should, uh, should be, then they will recommend detail inspection. Detail inspection takes place uh, at least once uh, every five years. It is quite costly, uh, involves quite bulky uh, uh, devices. Uh, but during this time, you, uh, usually the, the inspection requires um, or is assisted by instruments, uh, which, uh, for example, you can use um, X-rays, uh, acoustic signals, uh, infrared uh, signals to, to monitor uh, both microscopic and global uh, health of the structure. Again, following this detailed inspection, if people suspect that there are some uh, microscopic fractures uh, to the structure, then they uh, recommend a special inspection. This special inspection uh, does not really focus on the entire structure, but localized. So in this case, uh, highly sensitive, highly accurate uh, instruments will be used and uh, expert in you know, stress fracture uh, are involved to examine the integrity of the structure. As you can see, monitoring a civil structure is quite complex, quite costly. Uh, more importantly, especially during the last two inspection phases, the, uh, the, the, the civil structure should be interrupted, uh, giving the normal functioning. For example, if, if it's bridge, either it's partially, uh, it will be partially blocked or it will be blocked uh, entirely then an um, instrument will be installed and this is also costly and complex uh, 
and it may take some some time during uh, the inspection. Uh, in this regard, uh, broadly speaking, we can uh, classify uh, inspections into uh, phases or into big categories. The first one is the local inspection technique. This is highly targeted um, inspection to identify uh, quite imperceptible uh, fracture, microscopic uh, fractures in the, the structure. And this requires a significant amount of time, as I said, in the disruption of the normal operation of the uh, bridge or the structure. The other one is a global inspection. The global inspection looks into uh, problems which are big enough to affect the, the the response of the structure to both ambient and uh, forced excitation, which, uh, for example, the uh, problem with cables, problems with uh, bearings, problem with you know, the big components of the, the structures. Following the collapse of the bridge in Minnesota, uh, scientists or researchers start to uh, investigate to what extent they can use wireless sensor uh, networks uh, for this type of uh, purposes. Why are wireless sensor networks interesting? They are interesting in many respects. Because, uh, to begin with, because the, the, the sensor nodes are quite small, you can easily place them in uh, places which are otherwise accessible, uh, inaccessible for um, wired sensors. You can easily attach them into the cables, into the uh, towers, into the decks. Uh, secondly, you can do the deployments uh, without actually interrupting or affecting the normal operation of the, the structure. Uh, secondly, because the sensors now can communicate with one another, uh, we can achieve a high resolution, both spatial resolution and temporal resolution. And this also enables you to determine uh, dependency between the different parts of the, the, the structure. You can examine uh, multidimensional correlations uh, to easily identify where the problem is. Uh, because one of the problems, for example, with uh, local inspection is finding or determining where exactly these microscopic problems are. But with sensor network, because they can be spread, they, you know, you, you, we can use uh, large-scale deployment, it is possible to identify, to localize uh, problems. The other problem, of course, with uh, one of the uh, problems with wireless sensor uh, networks is that they operate with exhaustible batteries so that you cannot deploy them for more than, let's say, one year. Uh, this is one of the shortcomings of uh, operating with exhaustible batteries. Uh, secondly, because of the limitation of resources we have on board, uh, we cannot execute complex uh, algorithms. So wireless sensor networks are good for global inspections, uh, for short to medium term uh, deployment, but once local problems are identified, then of course, uh, a more rigorous uh, in uh, inspection should take place using more advanced and complex devices. Uh, this is a typical example of uh, the deployment of wireless sensor network at the Golden Gate uh, Bridge in uh, Berkeley. Uh, a researcher there, they uh, designed a wireless sensor network consisting of 64 sensor nodes. Uh, the nodes were deployed on the decks, as you can see, and uh, uh, along the towers, on, on the towers, and uh, also on the suspension cables. The nodes could be able to self-organize to set up a network. They uh, collaborated to transfer data to a remote a base station using multi-hop uh, communication. Uh, you can see here some of the detailed uh, uh, configuration and uh, specification 
of the deployment uh, setting. Another uh, application uh, for wireless sensor networks is uh, traffic control. Uh, for now, we just focus on uh, ground transportation. Uh, ground transportation for many countries is a vital and complex uh, socio-economic uh, infrastructure. Uh, it is not just a uh, driving car from home to uh, office, but it's uh, ground uh, transportation links, uh, a variety of uh, supply chain systems, uh, and other type of uh, delivery uh, systems. Uh, one of the main problems of uh, traffic control uh, or uh, ground transportation is congestion. In many countries, uh, congestion is a big problem and unfortunately nobody profits from this. For example, uh, the cars consume a, a large amount of fuel uh, during starting and uh, braking. Uh, this is also the time where they release, uh, uh, you know, unhealthy gases into the uh, environment. So for uh, pollution, this is the uh, worst case. And people also waste precious time uh, on the street. So uh, employees uh, suffer uh, stress. Employers, they uh, don't get their employees on, on time. Uh, the, for the environment, this is not good, and also it's quite costly. In America, for example, in 2009, the Urban Mobility Report, uh, in 2007, sorry, uh, for the 2007 uh, uh, Urban Mobility Report indicated that 4.2 billion extra hours were wasted because of congestion. Uh, and 2.8 billion gallons of extra fuel were used as a result. And overall congestion cost the country about 87 billion US dollar. This is an increase of 50% over the previous uh, decade. So it is reasonable to harness the uh, power of technology to uh, predict congestion, uh, to provide drivers alternative paths on time so that this uh, problem can be alleviated. Uh, what are some of the uh, stages or some of the, the tasks involved, uh, involving uh, traffic control? Uh, for the first information is to, the first task is to collect enough information about the, the type of car, the, the, the density of traffic, and of course the uh, destination of uh, driver. And for this, uh, it is possible not only to, to predict uh, congestion on a specific uh, location, but also possible to take into account dependency and driving habits to uh, predict the congestion of large uh, areas. And then once a congestion is um, predicted, alternative routes can be recommended to drivers on time. How can uh, sensing uh, help in uh, dealing with uh, congestion? The first one is to use sensors to uh, estimate the number of cars uh, which are on the street. Of course, there are radar systems, there are camera systems. So when we talk about wireless sensor networks or any other wired uh, sensor networks, these are used as uh, additional uh, technologies to enrich uh, uh, our knowledge about uh, congestion. 
So one of the uh, proposed solution is to bury uh, inductive uh, loops every 10 or uh, 50 uh, meter in the streets. How does the uh, system work? So inductive loop up is just a simple conductor or sometimes we use uh, coils. And if you remember from uh, Faraday's law, if you have a, a coil and then let a current pass through this coil, uh, then there is a magnetic uh, field will be set up around this uh, coil. The magnitude of the magnetic field, the direction of the magnetic field are dependent on the amount of current uh, supplied to the conductor. Now imagine you put a ferromagnetic material near this setup. So we have a, a coil and so this coil current is passing, a magnetic flux is set up with a known direction and magnitude. And then you bring a ferromagnetic substance near this uh, coil. Of course, the ferromagnetic substance attracts the uh, magnetic field to itself because it is, uh, it has a high affinity to uh, magnetic field, thereby disturbs the structure of the, or the distribution of the magnetic field. Now, if this ferromagnetic substance were to, to move, then of course the magnetic flux also distribution will, will, will change depending on the speed and the direction of this ferromagnetic uh, substance. Now imagine this ferromagnetic substance is the car. And of course, when cars drive by, depending on their speed, depending on their size, uh, they, they, they disturb the magnetic uh, flux set up in a different way. And from that, it is possible to sense the presence of cars as well as the, the speed at which they are driving. It is a simple setup. And uh, because the, the, the coil is buried for arcades, for traffic control under the street, uh, it is not also easily affected by weather uh, and also by rain. But the only problem is, of course, you have to now uh, change the structure of the street because you have to bury uh, the coils in the, uh, the street. This is uh, quite inconvenient and also costly. Some places around the world, this is used to monitor cars. I know one case in Boston, um, but not all countries use this type of uh, setup. Instead, uh, we can use uh, micro sensors, MEMS, uh, micro mechanical uh, sensors to uh, sense or to even to sense uh, the uh, disturbance in, in the magnetic field. And this is how uh, we can use wireless sensor network, networks to monitor traffic. To begin with, we don't need to set up our own magnetic field. Fortunately, the Earth itself produces its own magnetic field. It's already available. This, uh, magnetic field is not only available, it is available everywhere. Now what we need is just to have a very small sensor node consisting of some uh, uh, ferromagnetic substance. We supply this sensor node with a ferromagnetic substance, a known uh, current. This here we, uh, I have used uh, a simple uh, set up. If you have this ferromagnetic substance and if you let a current pass through it, then a magnetic field in this direction will be set up. Now imagine this is available and then a car, a car will pass by at a certain speed and of course the car disturbs the, the, the distribution of the magnetic field. Alternatively, because we have already a magnetic field set up by the Earth, we just need a car to pass by 
to disturb this magnetic field and we just need to measure the disturbance. The same setup can also measure the disturbance in the magnetic field and based on that we can determine the presence of car in a street. So the magnitude and direction of the disturbance again of the Earth's magnetic field depends on the speed of the car, the size of the car, the density of the car and of course the permeability of the car. The permeability is how permissive the, the, the substance is to induce magnetic field around it. Uh, on most all road vehicles, cars contain, of course, a large mass of steam uh, in the, the front, which is the motor, and the permeability of steel is much higher than the surrounding air. That means it is possible, if a car passes by, it is possible to gather the Earth's magnetic field to itself, and when it is gone, it will release this uh, concentration back to normal. So you can see that there is uh, a gathering and releasing of a uh, magnetic uh, field when cars uh, drive by. And if we just use a magnetometer to measure this disturbance, it is possible to sense uh, the presence of cars, not only the presence of cars, but also their, uh, their speed from which it is possible to predict congestion. This is a typical example. Here you see a car is driving by and the Earth's magnetic field is now uh, disturbed because the front part of the car, which, uh, which uh, houses the, the motor, is highly sensitive to, to magnet. So when the car approaches, the magnetic field gathers to this, towards this uh, uh, component. And if the car drives by, then again, the magnetic field is disturbed. And we measure this by simply using by using a simple magne magnetometer sensor. So if you can put a large amount of magnetometer sensor along a street, they can set up a wireless sensor network. They can collaborate with one another. So we are now not only in a position to measure or sensor distribution of magnetic flux, but also we can determine the, the distance, we can determine the direction, we can determine the, the change in the uh, distribution of the magnetic field to have a more accurate information about the condition on the streets. Another application of wireless sensor network is uh, telemedicine. I have picked up just one example, but we can, I can give you uh, lots of other um, examples. Uh, because of time limitation, we don't need to uh, discuss all of them. The idea is the following. If you have a problem, normally you have to go to a doctor, you have to sit in a controlled environment while the doctor makes uh, takes some measurement. Uh, your electrocardiogram may be measured, electromyogram may be taken, uh, blood pressure and all. Uh, this, of course, for many people, a great inconvenience because they have to take leave from their um, work. Uh, it may take some time to get there. In, for some elderly people, this also means additional cost and also uh, breaking of some uh, habit, for example, meeting people or going to fitness and stuff, uh, etc. Wireless sensor network can at least uh, simplify this, this task uh, because we can deploy sensors on the body of patients. These sensors are uh, wireless. They are also unobtrusive, so they don't, you can hide them behind the jacket or you can place them uh, on the surface of the skin and uh, wear a t-shirt or um, uh, a shirt. And these wireless sensors can sense uh, useful biomedical uh, data. Either they can save the data locally or communicate with one another to transfer the data um, to a remote uh, station where doctors and health uh, 
uh, person is can uh, monitor uh, the uh, health condition of the patient. So one of these uh, application is gastroparesis, uh, and uh, I will briefly discuss what a gastroparesis is. Uh, normally, the stomach and the intestine are responsible for uh, driving out uh, food, uh, you know, digested food uh, from the body. Especially the vagus nerve is responsible for contracting the stomach muscles and the intestine muscles so that food can always be uh, driven into the uh, large intestine. But for some reason, either because the vagus nerve is not working uh, properly or because they are some other uh, stomach and intestinal problems, some people may have a uh, problem with, uh, you know, driving out from, from the body. Uh, one of the symptoms is, for example, con um, constipation. To uh, diagnose this type of uh, problem, existing methods uh, are all of them not seamless or not, uh, how can I put it, uh, harmless. One of the uh, mechanisms to uh, gastroparesis simply means the uh, difficulty of stomach and intestinal walls to squeeze uh, properly so that food, uh, you know, uh, digested food can leave uh, the body on time. Uh, when uh, people have this type of uh, problem, doctors usually can give them uh, read, uh, one of the uh, mechanisms to diagnose this problem is nuclear medicine. In nuclear medicine, uh, doctor embed um, radio a very small radioactive material in the food. This radioactive material releases um, radiation. Uh, so, so it will be ingested into, into the body because this radioactive material releases uh, radiation. Uh, we can use a sensor outside of the body to uh, see the, the movement, the speed of the, the, the radioactive material in uh, the, the, the location of uh, the radioactive material and how long it dwells in certain part of the the body so it is possible by diagnosis or by by investigating or examining the duration it takes to leave a certain part of the body it is possible to determine where it is and why it is taking so much time another uh, uh, problem is the anthrodiodinal uh, motility again uh, in this case uh, we use uh, radioactive material uh, instead of, you know, uh, ingesting it, it can be put in a certain part of the, the, the body and we uh, doctors examine how long it would just to, to leave that, that part. Another is to use electro uh, gastrogram. Electro gastrogram simply means uh, it's like an electro um, cardiogram. Uh, two or more electrodes will be attached to the uh, duodenal part or the stomach or the intestinal part of the body and measure the electrical energy um, uh, produced by the contraction and relaxation of the muscles in, in that area. Usually in our body, there are three types of um, cells which produce electrical energy uh, when they are excited. These are the tissue cells, muscle cells, and nerve cells. So this is, for example, how the heart produces um, electrocardiogram because there are nerve and uh, muscle cells uh, which are responsible for contracting and relaxing the muscles of the the heart. Uh, so if uh, these cells are given some excitation, they generate electrical energy, and this electrical energy. Uh, tickles the walls of the heart to produce, uh, you know, contraction and relaxation. So in the same way, the, if the vagus nerve is uh, healthy, for example, then it always uh, induces the stomach and uh, intestinal cells 
to relax and contract by giving them an uh, electric uh, impulse. So this impulse can be measured using uh, electrogastrogram. And by analyzing the waveforms produced, it's possible whether uh, there is a problem in, in that area. Uh, of course, when the, the problem is uh, more serious, then you can use endoscopy and also computer tomography to localize the problem. In, uh, to localize the problem. Uh, other complement scientists uh, produce this type of very small wireless sensor node. This wireless sensor node consists of a pressure sensor pH sensor and uh, temperature sensor. Uh, the recent uh, production also uh, embeds micro camera in it. It is uh, possible, it, it's capable to communicate the data wirelessly and it can be ingested uh, into the body without any harm whatsoever. So what happens is outside we can set up a, a, a receiver to communicate with this device. The uh, wireless uh, motility sensor can be ingested and from the time it uh, enters into the mouse on a regular interval it samples um, body temperature, uh, pressure and also the uh, pH concentration in the body to determine whether you know the, 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 there is high concentration of acid in in the body. If, for example, food does not leave the body on time, uh, this uh, food becomes acidic and it's possible to sense uh, how long uh, it has been in, in, in the body. And uh, from the time, as I said, it enters into the uh, body, this wireless sensor node communicates all the sensor data to give us a more accurate information um, regarding the whereabouts of the uh, motility sensor and why it is there because now we don't merely sense the presence of this uh, wireless sensor node as the case with the uh, uh, nuclear medicine but it is also very active because it consistently samples the, the pressure uh, it experiences the temperature and also the uh, pH it experiences. Completely harmless, you can take this to your office, uh, you can work undisturbed without feeling being diagnosed at all, and it enables great flexibility in not only diagnosis but also um, monitoring patients with gastroparesis. Uh, Another application uh, for wireless sensor networks is uh, pipeline monitoring. You may see, you may not see them every day, but pipelines surround us and are vital infrastructure for civilized life. They transport water, they, tra they transport oil, they transport gas, and also they transport our wastes. And the integrity of this infrastructure is so vital uh, because if a, because of their length, because of their complexity, uh, it's very difficult to diagnose if leakage happens on pipelines. Fortunately, we can use simple sensors. We can embed these sensors um, in pipelines to measure pressure, to measure temperature, to measure, to measure acoustic, all of which are quite vital to determine about the flow of the fluid inside the pipeline, the, the pressure the pipeline experiences as a result of irregularity in the uh, fluid. We can sense uh, the, the temperature to de detect and localize uh, leakage points. It is absolutely vital uh, to know what type of substance the um, pipeline transporters in order to determine uh, pressure as well as leakage. Uh, for example, in fluid pipelines, if a leak happened between the joints of a pipeline, at that point, there will be a hotspot. 
and this can be detected by using a temperature sensor. However, if uh, instead of uh, fluid, the pipeline transport gas, uh, the hot spot, it, it's not a hot spot we experience at the point where there is leakage, instead it's a cold spot. So it is important to understand this. Uh, similarly, uh, leakage always uh, creates imbalanced uh, temperature uh, and also back propagation. That means uh, there is acoustic produce uh, is produced inside this pipeline in the, the directional propagation also important, which is why we use acoustic sensors, pressure sensors and uh, temperature sensors. In some cases also infrared sensors to detect a uh, problem in complex uh, pipelines. Uh, one example of pipe uh, pipeline uh, monitoring is the PipeNet project in the US where a researcher deploy a wireless sensor network to uh, monitor uh, waste uh, products, uh, sorry, uh, domestic uh, uh, swearage. Uh, the problem with domestic swearage is that uh, traditionally the pipelines are installed in such a way that uh, the swearage leaves the home or the town or the city and the final destination is a nearby river where the uh, the swearage will be uh, released. Uh, of course, in some uh, um, cases, uh, not only the domestic swearage, but also uh, rainwater runoff and in, in industry uh, water, uh, wastewaters uh, can intermingle together and they will be uh, released uh, together. This may have uh, not just may, but this has a great impact not only on the environment, also on the uh, on our uh, life. As a result, this uh, project intended to measure because sometimes you know the uh, swearage may also mix itself with uh, uh, underground water, so that the water we can drink may be affected by by the swearage. So in this uh, project, the researcher use uh, pH sensors and pressure sensors uh, and acoustic sensors to uh, measure not only uh, the, the, the distribution of uh, water in pipelines, but also the quality of water uh, in, in, in pipelines. Okay, so here the pressure and pH sensors uh, were installed uh, on a 12 inch cast iron pipe. So they could uh, sense uh, the, the pressure using piezoresistive silicon uh, sensor. The sensor network as a whole was uh, programmed to sample the, the, the pipe uh, for uh, at a 100 hertz uh, rate for five seconds and repeat this sensing every five minutes and transfer the data uh, remotely. They use also a um, silver, silver chloride uh, electrode to sense the pH quality and this was also sampled uh, every 10 seconds at 100 uh, hertz rate and this has, was repeated every five uh, minutes. The installation was quite seamless, as I said. The network could uh, self-organize and a large amount of data could be collected to make sure that the water we drink is healthy and the pipelines uh, transporting our waters are also, also healthy. Okay, another application for wireless sensor network is uh, precision agriculture. Uh, what do we mean by precision agriculture in general? Uh, here the focus is a very large agricultural field. 
in this very large agricultural field, uh, we may plant, let's say, um, orange trees or mango trees or apple trees. So in this very large uh, field, it is important to administer all resources efficiently. It's also very important to monitor the quality of products because these products are in most cases to be exported somewhere. So that means the quality of the yield absolutely affects the profit. The, because now we are dealing also a very large agriculture, we have to orchestrate a large amount of additional supply and chain uh, systems to make sure that we have the right amount of manpower uh, for different tasks to make sure that the, the yield we uh, produce meets the requirements of the market it is on the market on time and so on it just needs a precise calculation of each and every step because now we are dealing with a vast area, deploying wireless sensor network is quite ideal, uh, not only to monitor uh, the overall climate in, uh, of the field, but also a microclimate uh, of the field so that we can precisely determine how much resources we should invest there, how much product we uh, can get and with, with, with what quality. Uh, and also we should uh, uh, deal with climate change at a micro level, not at a macro level. We should deal with weeds, we should uh, deal with pests. So we have to uh, predict the, uh, you know, the resources we need to fight uh, climate change, to fight uh, weeds and pests. Or we have to uh, administer, as I said, fertilizers, waters, pesticides, herbicides, and additional resources. We could also measure the, the, the quality of the soil, the moisture of the soil, not at the macro scale, but also at the micro scale. Uh, so for all these type of tasks, deploying wireless sensor network is ideal, partly because as I said, the sensors can self-organize. We can uh, achieve very high special temporal uh, resolutions. We can sample the sensors at a very small uh, interval, unlike classical methods, which uh, require wired sensing uh, systems or a regular sampling of soil, regular sampling of uh, water, regular sampling of uh, product, and so on. As I said, uh, precision agriculture involves lots of highly detailed and mechanized uh, tasks, including uh, monitoring yield, uh, mapping yield, that means uh, what type of product do I get, where, with what quality. Uh, again, application of fertilizer is not uniform because uh, at micro level, the quality of the soil, the quality of the climate, the quality of the weather is quite different. So here, variable rate fertilizer should be used. Uh, again, weed mapping, uh, estimating uh, the amount of weed uh, we have to deal with, uh, and so on. For all these purposes, sensor networks are quite, quite ideal. I'm going to give you two examples where people used a wireless sensor network uh, to monitor uh, the quality of a product. One of them deals with a wine vineyard and the other uh, deals with a potato field in the Netherlands. Uh, in Europe, uh, especially in Southern Europe, uh, you know that uh, the Wine industry is a very important industry. Uh, the, here, for the monitoring the quality of a product, it is important to understand the microclimate. So when I say microclimate, imagine I mean the distribution of temperature, the distribution of humidity, the distribution of barometric pressure 
at a square meter uh, resolution. If I ask you, for example, what is the temperature in New York, you'd, right, you'd say, you, you can tell me, uh, the city where I'm living today, Dresden, for example, has a temperature of six degrees centigrade. Uh, we won't quarrel about this uh, amount because we assume this is a fair uh, estimation for winter. But of course, Dresden is a big city and the temperature changes from place to place. Uh, it's also a, a, a big city where in some part of the city we have industry, in some part of uh, uh, um, the city, especially in the inner part of the city, we have lots of restaurants which produce their own heat and uh, upset the balance of uh, temperature distribution in the, in the city. Similarly, when we are dealing with uh, a vineyard, the microclimate is very important to predict the quality of yield and all other uh, aspects related to uh, climate. So here, the purpose of the deployment was to monitor the temperature distribution uh, in the difference in temperature be, between the, the, the peak time and the uh, trough time uh, of the day. Because the, the, not only the amount of heat that is produced at any given time important for the um, vineyard, uh, apparently it's also important to understand the difference in, in temperature. Okay. So the uh, researchers in Italy, they used a wireless sensor uh, network to monitor and uh, characterize the temperature distribution in a vineyard. They use 65 sensor nodes at a 10 to 20 meter uh, distance to monitor uh, microclimate. Uh, they uh, reported that it was very easy because of the structure, the grid structure of a vineyard. It is relatively easy to deploy the sensor uh, node. The sensor node could uh, self-organize, uh, support uh, multi-hop communication, do in-network processing to aggregate the temperature difference, and send the data uh, remotely. Uh, so what did they, they observe? So the data were used to investigate several uh, aspects of the vineyard. The first uh, aspect they uh, investigated was the covariance between the uh, temperature data. That means the, the variance in temperature between two different uh, places to see how um, the microclimate is uh, behaving in a consistent way. This is important to uh, predict uh, yield and uniformity of uh, yield. They also investigated growing degree day difference, the, 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 the difference in temperature. Um, they could estimate uh, frost damage. Frost damage happens when the temperature sinks below uh, 10 degrees Celsius. Uh, so according to the author's report, the extent of variation in this vineyard there was a measured difference of over 35% of heat summation units in as little as 100 uh, meters, which confirms that micro, understanding microclimate matters when it comes to uh, 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 cultivating wine in a vineyard. The other... Uh, Agricultural field of interest is a potato field in uh, the Netherlands. Potatoes can easily be affected by fungus. And the uh, uh, climate uh, where the fungus can easily uh, strive uh, depends on the, the, the temperature, the humidity, uh, the temperature and the humidity of the, the place. So in the, the purpose of this uh, wireless sensor network was to monitor um, fetal fortra in um, a potato field. This is a fungal uh, disease 
uh, affecting the, the, the potato. So climate, uh, understanding the, the, the microclimate in this um, field was uh, for the uh, researchers uh, important to again uh, predict the presence, the magnitude of uh, fungus so that they can estimate the amount of uh, um, uh, herbicide uh, they can apply to fight this uh, fungal disease. So the idea was to monitor the humidity and the temperature in the in the field and also wetness in the in the air because it also contributes to the um, uh, development of this fungal disease. They uh, deployed uh, 150 uh, wireless sensor nodes are 20, 40, and 60 centimeter apart. You can see now that they are really interested in understanding the microclimate. Uh, then they used additional uh, 30 sensor nodes to make sure that the network is connected from one corner to, to the other and data can be um, collected from any part of the, the sensor network. Um, so the node sample temperature and humidity at a rate of one sample per minute and stored the result uh, temporarily. And then the data are com uh, communicated from the, all the nodes to a remote base station every 10 uh, minutes. Okay, another application, and this is our final uh, application for today, is active volcano. Uh, act, what are active volcano? How do they uh, come to take uh, place? Uh, active volcanoes usually occur when uh, broken slabs uh, of the Earth's uh, outer shell, outermost shell, uh, which is the lithosphere, they collide. These slabs usually float smoothly uh, if everything is fine, but because the Earth rotates uh, in a to a certain extent irregularly and uh, as a result of this irregular uh, rotation, the slabs collide together. These slabs are very hot slabs and as a result of this uh, collision, um, volcano uh, takes place. Uh, usually, the slab, because the, the slabs are hidden, we, we don't see them uh, or we can't uh, not easily uh, detect them. Uh, more often than not, uh, they happen to take place uh, on the surface of the ocean. Uh, at present, we have different types of very complex, very expensive uh, devices to sense active volcano. Uh, when these slabs collide with one another, remember, they not only uh, release a large amount of heat, but they also release acoustic signals. In, in some instances, they can also create earthquake. So active volcanoes can be sensed using uh, highly sensitive acoustic um, sensors or microphone, a seismic sensor for the, uh, for the vibration, and in some uh, cases also using uh, temperature sensors. But the problem with our, uh, the active volcano is that they spread over a large amount of area. So using standalone wired and bulky devices may not give you the right resolution in sensing. But if we use a wireless sensor network, again, you can deploy a large amount of wireless sensor network over a large uh, um, amount of area and because the sensors now collaborate with one another, do local processing, it is possible to detect not only the presence of active volcano but also the, the, the magnitude of the volcano in the direction of the volcano and if there are some disconnected regions to understand also the, the hidden cause for this uh, uh, disconnection. Uh, 
So there are two uh, deployment. Uh, I, some uh, researchers uh, at the uh, Harvard University, they uh, deployed a wireless sensor network in two different locations in Ecuador, uh, one in 2004 and the other in 2005. Uh, actually, the deployment setting was quite simple. In the beginning, they just used three different types of uh, sensors, uh, consisting mainly uh, high sensitive microphones. Uh, but in their second deployment, they increased the number of sensors to uh, 16 uh, nodes and integrate also additional seismic sensors for uh, accurate uh, sensing. Uh, the deployment uh, sets up a linear topology. That means that, as I told you, underneath when the Earth uh, rotates, the slabs come together and this may have a kind of chain uh, event. And to capture this uh, event, the researchers on the surface of the Earth, they used a linear topology wireless sensor network. And their um, report was quite impressive. They, should, uh, they were able to um, capture all the three interesting uh, events. That means acoustic, a vibration and uh, temperature. So the uh, researchers commented that it is important to uh, detect a discrete uh, event uh, because this uh, event uh, points to uh, eruptions, earthquakes, uh, as well as uh, tremors. And uh, the sensors should be sampled at high resolution. Uh, if we have the, the main problem with uh, using bulky, quite sophisticated uh, devices is that you cannot move them easily from uh, place to place. You, in some instances, you need to uh, deploy helicopters, you need to have external uh, power supply units, especially if you want to deploy them for uh, a longer period of time. But with wireless sensor uh, nodes, we don't have all these problems. All you just need is highly accurate, highly sensitive uh, sensors. Otherwise, the, the data can be uh, collected from the different sensors. You can even store them locally if the amount of data produced at the result is large. And then slowly the, the data can be either transferred wirelessly or uh, manually. Uh, by this, we come to the uh, conclusion of our session for today. In these sessions, uh, I discuss different types of applications for wireless sensor networks. So we have considered um, structural health monitoring, uh, traffic monitoring. We have considered uh, telemedicine. We've considered uh, precision agriculture and finally, active volcano monitoring. I hope this gives you an overview about the scope and usefulness of wireless sensor networks. In the next uh, session, we're going to focus on the node, on a single node to understand the, it is uh, architecture and the software support we need uh, to make it uh, functional. Thank you for listening and I'll see you uh, next week. Bye.